All right, everybody, let's take our seats and we'll go ahead and get started. Today's lecture is on solving complex problems. How do we do it? So for those of you out there taking, uh, viewing this as a virtual course, a um, couple of things I want to mention. Uh, we're going to do several examples in class today uh, that will require your participation. So what I'll do is I'll let you know where we're at and let you know that you can pause the video at that point in order to uh, read the screen or do the exercise that's there. Um, now before we start the actual lecture, uh, the next two slides each contain a single short story. What I'd like you to do is uh, read one of the two stories. Don't read both because that's going to diminish uh, what you'll get out of the uh, exercise that we'll do later in class. So pick either the first one or the second one. So I'm just going to switch to these. You can hit pause on the first one or the second one in order to, uh, to read. So here's the first one about Red Adair. So those in class can read it now. Those at home can pause it. And uh, the second story is The General and the Dictator. So once again, you can read that here in class, or uh, you can hit pause and read it uh, uh, while we wait. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started now that you've read one of those two stories. So I want to talk briefly about an overview for problem solving. What are the basic steps in problem solving to kind of give us a, a little bit of a framework to work on today? Uh, the first one is the problem search. And we're going to talk about this. For those in class, I gave out a, uh, a pre-assignment that we'll discuss here in just a moment. Uh, problem representation. Uh, this is actually where I've personally found the most uh, impact in changing how I represent the problem. I'm often able to solve a very hard problem in a short amount of time uh, just by uh, simply changing how I view it. Uh, solution method we'll talk about. Uh, solve. Uh, is obviously once you have a method you go to solve and then uh, at the end of each is you always evaluate your solution. So this is the problem I sent out uh, for those of you watching this virtually. You can hit pause and read it. But basically you're the new CEO of a company and you've just returned from a business trip and you're tired Okay, so this is the problem I sent out to everybody ahead of time. If you're doing this lecture virtually, um, you can pause here and read this. or read along with us. The new CEO of your company has just returned from a business trip in a bad mood. His luggage got lost and didn't, he didn't get to his room until the morning of his presentation to shareholders. He had to take his suit straight from the suitcase and wear it, and it was a complete mess and full of wrinkles. On his way back, he did some research and turns out there's 450 million business travelers per year in the U.S. and he's pretty sure many of them have the same problem. So he's asked you in NUCO to figure out a new product or service to offer to solve, I won't say solve this problem, I'll say a new product or service to offer to uh, 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 tap into this opportunity that he's seen. So the task for the groups is, is what is the problem that your group will find a solution for? So this is the problem search. Your CEO has come back and he's given you an opportunity area, but what's the problem you're going to try to solve? Where's the area of value that you want to kind of focus your product development and your marketing people on? So in a simple form, what is the problem in a brief statement? Um, and you need to state it in such a form that your product development team could take it and start working on it. So the idea is to state the problem in that it's obvious that I'm going to solve this and then I'll capture that opportunity. So we sent this out to everybody ahead of time. Uh, we got your feedback back and I'll share with you some of the results that we had. Now I did seed everyone with the following uh, example. So one possible way uh, of posing a problem would say the problem is that the airline's losing luggage and we should develop a product that prevents lost luggage. So this says the problem and the opportunity is in not having lost luggage. The second example I gave out was the problem is with the expectations of the shareholders. The company will hire a PR firm to start a campaign for casual attire at shareholder meetings. As you can see, each one of these problems, as stated, leads to a different type of solution. So let's take a look now at what you guys came up with as products. So this is how you defined the problem. So team one said the problem in the situation 
is that the business traveler has to lug his suitcase around everywhere that he or she travels. Okay, so the problem's with the suitcase. Second team, the problem is the lack of wardrobe flexibility backup for business travelers. So it's a problem of not having a backup. There doesn't exist an adequate suitcase that stores suits without getting them creased. Once again, back to the luggage. The next group had, how might we improve the way in which business travelers bring suits and other formal clothing on airlines? So this is about how they transport clothing. The problem is that clothes are not packed so that they are ready to go without preparation. So this went to the issue of when they came out of the suitcase, they weren't ready. Uh, the problem is that the CEO and all business travelers are forced to carry luggage when they travel on brief business trips. So once again, back to the problem of luggage. The problem in this situation is that the business traveler has to lug his suit around everywhere that he or she travels. So this goes to the example I had given of um, needing to wear the clothes. Let's go on a little bit further. Uh, let's see, the problem is that people traveling on business cannot afford the delays caused by misplaced luggage. We're back at luggage. Bringing formal attire for business travel is a hassle since luggage can be lost, clothes can get wrinkled, yet most travelers need formal clothing because a majority of travelers travel for high stakes business. So once we get into sort of both the luggage and the issue that we have to wear uh, dress clothes, and this team, we believe the problem that the suits get wrinkled in transit. And here's some problems that uh, a few of the staff members of the course brought up. Uh, the problem is that the garment is not stored without wrinkles. The problem is that the garment is displaced or wrinkled by a storage container. And the problem is that the garment does not retain memory or unwrinkled states. And finally, we have uh, Team 10 came in at the last minute. The problem is the necess necessity of transporting expensive clothing that's highly wrinkable. OK. Um, and here's two left. The problem is luggage tracking. And the problem is that suitcases wrinkle clothes. So I want you to notice something. I gave you two seed examples. One had to do with the lost luggage, and one had to do with the fact that we needed to wear clothing. And so if you look at the non-staff responses, so basically from the teams, how many of them were really like the seed examples I had given? Right? There was no mention in the problem from the CEO about what the problem was. He didn't mention the luggage. He didn't mention the airlines. He didn't mention the actual clothing. He didn't mention transportation. He didn't mention business meetings. He just stated the problem he personally had and that he thought there was an opportunity there. And if you look at the examples that I gave you ahead of time, they mentioned luggage, airline transportation, and the need to wear dress clothes. Only one team out of all of you described a problem unrelated to these seed examples. So this is a great example that we talked about before. I gave you a general problem, and then I give you two specific examples. And whether you knew it or not, all the ideas, the brainstorming you came up with, was right around those two ideas. There was little departure from those initial seeds. So right away in the problem search, we've realized that we already tend to look and find and define problems that relate to an already existing problem or a problem somebody stated. And this can be dangerous because we've talked in previous classes that if you go and ask your customers what they need, they probably can't tell you very, in a very articulate way what their true needs are. And if they can, it's probably a small value problem that they're telling everyone that's going to become a commodity. Remember, the goal is for you to discover those unseen opportunities. And what we see here is that it's likely that you're going to start initially to focus in on those problems that the customers or your market segment bring up. So I just thought this was interesting that only one team broke out of that initial paradigm, it seems. But the other part I want to talk about is now that you've stated the problems, I want you to look at what solutions come from those. And that should show you how the initial problem statement really drives what kind of solution you're going to do. So I uh, put these together. So of the solutions, uh, there was a number of solutions that resulted in a service. So have your outfit or choice delivered to your hotel or meeting, rent a suit, on-site rentals, rent a suitcase with all, you, all that you need in the airport, and a bag tracking service. So these teams saw their problem and the solution came in the form of a service. Uh, two teams looked at storage, so dedicated hanging space on the airlines for a fee, and custom suitcases that don't wrinkle clothing. Uh, and a few teams came up with products. Um, so the staff talked about a non-iron garment, like Brooks Brothers has nine iron shirts that are very popular 
uh, for men. Uh, team nine had a portable hair straightener for clothes. I thought this was kind of a cool analogy. Uh, team 11 had a GPS tracker for luggage, so once again back at the luggage. And 12 had a clothes fixer for quickly and effectively unwrinkling clothes that can be placed in hotel rooms. I know that sounds ridiculous. They actually sent a web page. There is an appliance that will actually dry clean in some fashion your clothes in your room uh, by taking the hanger and inserting it in sort of a closet type of thing. But as you can see, each one of these are a response to that initial problem statement. So we see in our problem search that our problem search tends to unconsciously stick with examples we've already seen. And if we want to discover the unseen opportunities, we need to break out of that space. And the second part is our solutions come almost directly from how we state the problem. And you can tell here we've got products, here we've got storage. On the previous slide, we had services. So there's a whole array of what your end product comes out to be that all starts with that initial problem search. And so what you want to do is you want to focus initially on what problem it is you want to solve. And you know, kind of like we did here, come up with a long list of them. Map them out and try to figure out what problems are going to lead to the most interesting and innovative solutions. All right? So the key is to start with the problem search. The next piece of problem solving is the representation. And I want to do an exercise here on um, selecting information. Uh, for those of you who are uh, attending virtually, just take out a sheet of paper. For everybody here, just take out a sheet of paper too. And I'm going to want you to write down, um, I'm going to go through a series of sentences. And I want, to, want you to write down the words that you think are important. Okay. Now you're probably a little confused right now because you're thinking, well, how do I know what important to? You know, what, how do I know what's important? How do I measure importance? Well, the point of this exercise we're going to go through is this is a lot like most problems that you experience in life. You're receiving information about the problem constantly, oftentimes before you actually really know what the problem is. And I want to show you how our minds are able to kind of form a representation or a picture in our heads of what exactly is important and not important. Okay? So just Whatever judgment you want to use, write down what you think is important or not important. Okay? All right, let's get started. I went to tea yesterday with an old friend, Mrs. Allsports. She has three daughters, Amelia, Bella, and Celia. On the doorstep, I met another friend who remarked that her own daughter was spending a yachting holiday at Sandville with one of Mrs. Allsport's girls. Over the teacups, it turned out that all three of the daughters are on holiday. Their interests are diversified. One is at Mudville, one is at Rockville, and one is at Sandville. I'll go back so you can see that again. To make the thing more confusing, one is playing tennis, one is yachting, and one is playing golf. It is further transpired that Amelia is not in Sandville, Celia is not in Mudville, and the girl who plays golf is not at Rockville. I tried to discover who the yachting enthusiast is, but could only find out that she is not Celia. Who is playing golf and where? All right, so I'm sure as you're going through this, you didn't have any idea how to judge what's important, but you probably pulled out words on each sentence that you thought likely were important. I sort of think about this as sort of a, a murder mystery, if you will. If you watch a murder movie or a mystery movie, throughout the entire movie, facts and information is being given to you, but you don't know what's important or not. And you pick up some, you don't pick up others, and at the very end, you then find out what was the important information. So this is an exercise that was actually done as part of a research paper. And what they did is they did exactly what we just did here. And here are um, the words. And this is the percentage of people in the first reading of people in experiment one that thought the words were important. Okay? 
Now you'll notice there's a first reading and a second reading. The first reading and second reading are just what we did. Is the first reading, they just repeated exactly the same thing the second time, but you'll notice you knew what the problem was after the first reading. So if you look at experiment one, as it moves down here under the second reading, you could clearly see that, for instance, I went to T, initially in experiment one, 30% of the people thought that was important. The second time, none of them thought that was important because they knew what the problem was. Now, in experiment two, the, what was different is they told everybody at the beginning what the problem was. They wanted to know who was playing golf and where. That was it. And then they started exactly the same sequence. So they knew what the problem was and had some framework to judge what was important. And you can walk down the column for experiment two during the first reading. And what you notice is that it's very similar to experiment one. And if you go over to the second reading, you'll notice that it correlates very well. So what this showed the researchers was that we already have some idea of what's important and what's not important. We can already pick out, and we do already pick out what information we think is important and not important. And I just find it amazing that without knowing the problem, most people picked out the key pieces of information. And that knowing the problem helped a little bit, but only changed it in a small way. And in fact, the only significant differences between knowing the problem ahead of time and not are just these three points. Everything else basically said the person who did not know the problem was able to pick out the same pieces of important information. So as you're approaching a problem, you need to realize that all the information leading up to it, you've already picked out what you think is important or not, whether you know it or not. But that's not actually a bad thing because we, as we develop over time, for most problems, we develop a sense of how to pick out what's important and what's not important, as exampled in this paper um, here. All right. The other thing is an interpreting information, both direct and inferred. So here's another experiment I want to do with you. We can do this together. A room in which we find a father, a mother, a son, and a baby. Okay? The father says, Pedro, Juanita is crying. Please change her. Okay? It's all the information you're given. Now I'm going to ask you a series of questions and see which ones you can answer and think after you figure out what you think your answer is, how it is you knew that and whether that really is a reasonable way to come about the factual knowledge that you use in problems. So who is the father talking to? Is he talking to the mother, the son, or the baby? List the names of the father, the mother, the son, and the baby. Well. I assumed Pedro was the son, Juanita was the baby, and mom, we don't know her name, and we don't know dad's name. But there's nothing up here that tells us other than Pedro and Juanita are likely not the father. We just assume Pedro was a boy, therefore it should be the son, and Juanita is crying. We assume mom doesn't cry, so therefore it must be the baby. But nothing in the problem is given that. That's all framed in how we've built our representation of the problem. Is the baby a girl or a boy? Most people think it's a girl. Why? Because we associate Juanita with being a girl's name. And we've already chosen that Juanita is the baby. What nationality is the family? Well, I think given that the names are from a Spanish root, we would assume they're maybe from Latin America or maybe from Spain. But none of that is stated up here. So you see how with simple pieces of information, we pull out a whole uh, uh, great deal of information that's inferred that we just apply without even knowing it. So I think this is kind of interesting because uh, there's a lot that I think we would all agree upon is true, but there's nothing in the statement that actually said that was true. So when we talk about representation, what do we mean? So I wanted to give you an example of some ways to represent 3.30 p.m. So we can do it in military time. We can do it as a visualizing a clock. Here's a 24-hour clock. We can actually think about where the sun is as a way of thinking where 3.30 p.m. is. We can think about 3.30 as being a fraction out of uh, 48 half hours in a day. What's going on here? 
Maybe 3.30 is when we take our medicine. And here's another one. Maybe 3.30 is when we get home from school. Maybe this is what the day looks like at our house at 3.30. All of these are different ways of representing 3.30 p.m. And we develop these representations almost automatically. And what we need to realize is that, not that this is bad, but we need to realize that we've done this and that we need to go back and check and see whether that representation really is the best one to be able to solve our problem. So um, I'll talk a minute about external and internal. Uh, internal representations are what we generate kind of in our own mind's eye. External representations are what we're going to develop outside of us. What's important to realize is that all representations start inside of your mind. Um, there was a great, uh, a great talk by the founder of Graffiti from the Palm Pilot. And what he talked about was the fact that um, we actually don't know what the real world is. All we know is how our brain interprets the sensor information we get from our eyes, our ears, and our nose. We have absolutely no idea what the real world is. All we know is the sensor information and how we interpret that. So our internal representation we think of as being the real world, but it's not. It's how we view and see the world. And that oftentimes doesn't really match what's out there. So here's an example. I'd like you to take a look at this slide. And the question is, can you find the mistake in this? All right, I'll give you a hint. The colors don't have anything to do with the mistake. Okay. The numbers don't have anything to do with the mistake. Can you see where the mistake is? About 90% of people don't catch it. Let me read it exactly as it's stated. Can you find the, the mistake? Our mind doesn't see the second the. It's because we know what it should say, and that's immediately how we interpret it, even though that is not factually what is there. In the previous example about the mother, the father, and the son, and the baby, we had information and we inferred a representation of what everyone was. Here, the information is right there in front of us, and we ignored it because it didn't match our internal representation of what this sentence should be. And I think that's pretty interesting about how our internal representations really can change the way that we see things for good or for bad. Now, I talked earlier about external representations, and here's just a bunch of examples out here. What external representations do for us is they allow us to, first off, uh, collect information on a wider scale that we can keep in our memory. So external representations are a way for us to basically, we'll talk a little bit later, uh, extend our memories almost to uh, an infinite pool. The second piece is an external representation allows you and me to talk about the same thing in a, in a common context. And so we start with our internal representations and we form an external representation. But most of us that grow up in the same area, the same socioeconomic uh, class, maybe the same geographical region, we tend to have the same biases in our internal representations. And we'll actually generate external representations that to both of us seem perfectly fair, but are actually inaccurate. All right, so I want to show you why representation matters. The before, I really was just showing you how, how your internal representation can be quite different than the real world. Let's look at an example, OK? This is a, an example out of a, a math science problem. You are standing by the side of a river which is flowing past you at a rate of five miles an hour. You spot a raft one mile upstream on which there are two boys helplessly adrift. Then you spot the boys' parents one mile downstream, paddling upstream to save them. You know that in still water, the parents can paddle at the rate of four miles per hour. All right, this sounds like a horrible problem that we remembered from uh, seventh grade in algebra. So you're given all this information, and in your mind, you're probably setting up a representation for how you're going to solve the problem. Well, there's a couple different ways to do this. One is actually hard, and I think one is easy, or easier, I'll say. So the question is, how long will it take for the parents to reach the boys? Okay. So here's a picture. If you can imagine, you're sitting right here. That's you. 
here's mom and dad, here's the kids. And so you need to figure out how fast the kids are moving down the water. You need to figure out how fast mom and dad are paddling up the river. You know the distance from you sitting on the rock to the bottom and you sitting on the rock and the top. And you could go and calculate this and write a bunch of equations and try to figure this out. This is how most of us would do it in an algebra class. But this is the hard way to do this. Instead, think about your sitting in mom and dad's raft. You and the kids are on the water. You're moving at the same speed with the current. So the speed of the current doesn't matter at all. All you need to know is how far the kids are from you, two miles, and how fast can you paddle, four miles an hour. So it takes you a half an hour to get to them. So you can see this representation of you sitting on the rock and viewing it externally and you sitting in the center changes dramatically how difficult this problem is to solve. And so this is a common example that scientists and engineers and anybody tries to do in, find, in solving hard problems is finding a representation that's easier to solve. Okay? All right, so here's another exercise that's uh, kind of interesting. So uh, the exercise, as you can see in the upper left, we have a box and it's composed of, of four matchsticks. Each side is a matchstick. Okay? I have a diagram here of five boxes that are made up of 16 matchsticks. Okay? There's no matchsticks sitting on top of one another. All the matchsticks are alone. And so the goal of the problem is to move three sticks to form only four squares. Okay? So we have five here. We want to do four. And we want to move only three matchsticks. Okay. So that's the problem. So I want you to take for a second and picture what, what does the end result look like? Just what pops into your mind? You need four squares. What does it look like? The question is, what does it look like here? And we'll talk about the operators in just a second. So here's two examples. Did any of you kind of think of these? You know, this one popped into my head immediately. I didn't think about this one. So you knew you needed four boxes. Probably a picture of four boxes immediately popped in your head. What's the problem with these? Well, let's just look on the, uh, the boxes on the left. Let's just count the matchsticks. There's two on the top, two on the sides, two on the bottom, two on the left. So it's two, four, six, eight. And in the center, there's only four matchsticks, so eight plus four is 12, right? We don't have 16 matchsticks. That's because they're sharing matchsticks in the center. Same problem with this. So the initial representation we had actually doesn't fit the constraints we have in the problem. And this is what often we do, is we get a problem and we immediately think of what the solution looks like, and that immediate solution eh, may not actually work. Here's another one of four squares. Okay, this has exactly 16 matchsticks. What's the problem with this one? Well, maybe a little bit harder, but I can't figure out any way just to move three matchsticks and get a picture like this. So in both these cases, you come up with a picture that meets some of the requirements, and then you try to force the matchstick movement. So um, why don't you guys go ahead and try this? You can move three matchsticks, and you need to create four boxes. You already know four pictures that don't work. And it may help you try to visualize what might be a possible solution. So I'll give you a few minutes here. You can pause the tape if you want to do this. OK, let's go and see the solution. All right, so you can see there, I just moved, oh, sorry about that. I just moved these three matchsticks in gray to get the answer. That picture is not something that popped in my head at all. The first two did. And so this idea of problem representation is, is that once we're given a problem, we immediately try to think about what it looks like. And so we look at the problem goal. And I think one thing we should all do is not try to envision the solution before we solve the problem. Because sometimes we'll envision a solution that isn't even possible. So I want to talk about why problems are hard. And this is. Uh, some based upon uh, the research I've done and some a little bit on my own opinion here. So our representations are incorrect. Like with the matchstick problem, the four boxes on the left, it just wasn't the right picture of the final goal. 
Or maybe we pictured it as the raft problem where we were sitting on the rock. In that case, it wasn't that it was incorrect, it was just difficult. We need to invent a new idea, concept, or connection. So oftentimes, hard problems, there's a piece of them that has to be created. There is no method that we can just borrow and reuse. They're combinatorial or large. We'll talk about this in a second, but sometimes problems just take a long time to figure out. The decision method is not clear. There might be chance. There, we might be confused due to complexity. There might be competition going on, like in a game of chess. Uh, there may be multiple solutions, so finding a single solution is impossible. And maybe it requires specific knowledge. So if I needed to solve a problem in nuclear physics, I would probably need to know something about nuclear physics, which I don't. The last one is it requires memory. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there's two fallacies that human beings have, and one of them is memory is a problem for us. Okay, so nice segue into the two important human advantages and disadvantages for problem solving. We as humans are pattern matchers, period. That's what our brains do. They don't solve complex problems in the way we think about a computer. They solve them by matching patterns. But we can develop new patterns. We experience things, we take in data, we develop patterns, we develop representations of the world, and they grow with time. I think there was a great quote from Richard Feynman. Uh, he always was a big fan of using intuition, but the, the quote, I'm paraphrasing here, was basically, it's just fine to use intuition to solve a problem, but if your intuition is wrong, then you need to change your intuition. And that's all about changing how we think and we see the world. So let's talk a little bit of pattern matches. I think this is pretty cool. All right, I'd like you all to read this. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I bet you every one of you could read that without much difficulty, even though, I don't know, I haven't, I haven't calculated, maybe 50% of the letters are wrong. This is why typos generally don't bother the people who are writing them, because they form the message in their head, and they're just looking visually, they just see if the general character arrangement matches. When you read something you hadn't written, you're much more likely to catch these changes. But this, is, this to me was really amazing. All of us can read this. There's no problem. And the reason is, is that we don't read letters. We read words and phrases. It gets even better on the, uh, the next page. Try to read this one. It's pretty cool, right? I think 40% aren't even letters. We had no problem. And it's interesting because it says halfway down, now on, the, on, on this line, your mind is reading it uh, automatically. And it's true. By the time you get down to there, it, it's, initially it was a little awkward, but it gets super easy. So this is a great two examples of how our minds are matching pattern. They're not looking at the actual data that's there. And that is fabulous. That is how we're able to make connections, analogies. That's how we're able to be creative. People talk about and some people may disagree, computers can't be creative. And part of that is because, because they're not trying to make patterns and see some kind of overlap, they're trying to logically process information. The second piece is our memory is miserably small, unless. So we're gonna look at a little example to illustrate this. So I'm gonna give you a series of numbers, okay? Are you ready? One zero one zero 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 one one zero one one zero. I think I said that correctly. All right. Uh, ten. I think ten numbers. That's a little bit hard. What if I were to do this? For those of you not familiar, all I've done is taken one zero one zero, which are binary for two, and in my mind I said, okay, this is two two zero three one two. So now I've gone from ten to six. So I guess actually there's twelve there. Sorry, there's 12, and I've gone to six. Well, they've played this game, and they found that people uh, have done tests like this can actually go up to beyond 80 uh, random sequences by just continuing it on. So now you do binary in terms of four. So our actual memory can only hold a few pieces of information. I think typically you hear seven, plus or minus a couple. 
but certainly it's not much greater than 10. And so what we need to do to increase our memory capacity is package this into a framework that contains seven or less items. And so we build larger and larger representations, and that's how we as humans are able to keep track of things. If a problem involves a great deal of memory, we need a lot of data, we need to basically keep data and accurately record it, it becomes very difficult to do in your head. But computers can do that beautifully. And so we see that our pattern making ability makes it optimal for us to be creative and see the analogies that maybe a, a computer or a logic algorithm couldn't. But at the same time, the lack of a, an immense memory makes it harder for us to keep track of things. Although we can, as shown here, find ways to do this. So here's a final one I want you to do. I want you to memorize as many words as you can in the following. Okay, I can maybe remember the last couple words. Whites, eggs, that's about it, okay? That's pretty hard to remember, right? What if I took exactly the same words and reordered them? How many words can you remember from this? All you probably have to do is remember one or two words of each phrase and the phrase comes right up. So this is just another example of how our memories catalog information. We form patterns. We also form stories. We talked earlier about how story is important uh, to developing ideas. And part of stories is our mind developing a sequence of patterns to store information. By the way, this is how, um, uh, when they've done research on people with photographic memories, or they talk about a photographic memory, it really is just they're able to put together an algorithm, a series of pictures or stories of patterns that catalog the data. It isn't an ability to actually capture all the bits like the photographic memory would suggest. All right, so we've talked about problem search, we've talked about representation, which I think are the two areas. So let's talk about solution method. So there's really two areas of solution. On the left you see is mono solution. This is typical in science, failure analysis. Some examples are, why does an apple fall? Why does a bridge collapse? Who murdered Nicole Simpson? I don't know if you know who that is. But these are things where there's a single answer to. On the right are poly solutions, and these are very typical in design or engineering. Uh, to use the bridge as a counterexample, there's probably only one way for a bridge to collapse, but you could build a bridge in many different ways. All right, so there's two types of solution methods. The first are weak methods. And these don't require any knowledge about the specific problem. They use rule of thumbs or heuristics. And then what we have are what's called strong methods. And these utilize some knowledge about the specific problem or the problem type. And they can vary from general guidance, as in I've seen a problem similar to that, to I know exactly how to solve that. We'll look at specific examples of this in just a second. So let's focus initially on weak methods. So um, this is a binary search. You know, we start at the top, we have four choices, we choose one of those, we have choices, and we can examine each and every possible solution to a problem. And as you can see, this gets pretty exhaustive unless the problem's small. A great example is in chess. Uh, it depends upon where you get your data, but um, 10 to the 50th possibilities is one estimate for the number of possibilities in a chess game. To put that in perspective, there's only four times 10 to the 17th seconds in the universe. If you're not a math expert, basically this is 17, that's 50. This is many, if you did one solution possibility per second, you'd be billions of times longer than the age of the universe to go through each and every one of those. So the basic initial thing of trial and error for search, it's a very inefficient method. It's a last resort unless the problem is small. I don't know how many of you have had a, a, a combinational lock and you forgot the number, right? There's 10 on each. There's 1,000 different combinations here. It would take about 10 or 15 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, but we could actually go through this and solve this if we'd forgotten the combination. If you took and made this 10 dials long, it would be uh, beyond our capabilities to do by hand. But for a, a three-turn lock, we could do a trial and error search. The next one is proximity methods. 
And here, instead of being random, you sort of look around you and try to figure out, well, there's all these choices for me to do. Does any one of them look better than the others? And you basically base it on some type of uh, heuristic. Uh, one heuristic is a hill climb. And what you do in this is you choose the direction in your search that makes the greatest immediate progress towards your goal. So the example I use here is to get to the top of the mountain, you might sit here, look around you, and find uh, the tallest highest slope, basically what's going up the fastest, and start walking up that direction. But what's the problem with that? If any of you, any of you go on hiking, uh, you know, here in New England, the White Mountains are up in Vermont. Uh, typically there's fog. Um, oftentimes it's just drizzly. But sometimes you see what's called a false peak. From your perspective looking up, you see a peak, you get to the top of the peak, and you find out, nope, you're not at the top. The top's much further off and much higher. So the hill climb doesn't necessarily take you to the specific peak. And just imagine, if you're sitting on a, a, a peak that's not the top, this proximity, this hill climb method, doesn't really work for you because everywhere is down, right? Another type is a means end analysis. And here, you basically start with where you are and where you want to go and look at what the difference is. And uh, here's one example uh, we'll show you in a second. You try to reduce each of the differences till you get to a solution that meets in the center. Uh, maybe not in the order of time of importance. So here's an example from Weisberg's book. Um, I want to take my son to nursery school. What's the difference between what I have and what I want? It's one of distance. What changes distance? My automobile. My automobile won't work. What is needed to make it work? A new battery. What has new batteries? An auto repair shop. I want the repair shop to put in a new battery. I apologize, that was uh, pasted. Pasted incorrectly there. But the shop doesn't know I need one. What's the difficulty with this? One of communication. What allows communication? A telephone. So the idea is he basically starts with what's the problem from here to here and breaks it down and tries to work into the middle. This is a little bit of, a, of an awkward one, but at least takes you in this idea of I start with my main problem and I try to work in from the outside. So we talked about this means end versus hill climbing. Um, means ends allows you to look at multiple dimensions. Hill climbing is just you have to pick one metric and choose what direction has, improves that metric the most. Uh, means end creates sub goals, but it's still not very, very ideal. Um, the problem with both proximity methods are blind alleys. If I get into an alley that doesn't have a, a, a better solution than where I'm at, I get stuck. Uh, detour problems, what if I take the wrong road and I'm off someplace that's totally away from where I want to be? There really is no way to get me back. And then the false peak we talked about um, earlier. So these are sort of ways to do if you don't have any other uh, ideas on how to solve problems. Now the next one is uh, what's called a fractional method. And the basic idea is, if you look here on the bottom, you've got initial state A, I want to go to state G, which is my goal, and there's something preventing it. I don't know, some kind of barrier. And the idea with a fractional method is break this up into sub-goals that maybe allow you to get around that barrier, or maybe it makes each piece a little bit simpler. And so I want to share with you an example. This is a very famous uh, puzzle that's used in psychology and creativity. It's called the Tower of Hanoi. And so on the left, you see three uh, um, sticks, if you will, and three disks of different size. Here is the initial state. Here is the goal. It works really well for, um, uh, for problem solving because it's clearly what the initial and the end is. And the rules are that you can only move one disk at a time, and a large disk must never be placed on a small disk. Okay? So you can see, as I start to move these over, I have two empty ones. I've got to figure out a way to get this over here. I can't put the big one on top of the small ones. And I just want to mention, um, some of these problems seem kind of trivial and simple. The reason why psychologists do them is, is not because the people they're working with aren't bright. Most of these experiments are done by college professors on other college professors or college students. The reason they use these simple problems is they eliminate a lot of the, but, oh, maybe that doesn't work here, this doesn't work here. The simpler the problem is, the easier it is to make it clear and concise so that you're only measuring what you want. So back to the problem. So here we are, and the question is, how do I get from here? What might be a sub-goal? Well, one sub-goal would be, I know my end state needs the largest one here, so 
I want to get my large ring there. I know I got to do that. And to get that there, I know I need to get off the two small ones. So I might do a sub goal that gets the two small ones on this peg because I know then I can go from this sub goal to that sub goal. So these are examples of, of trying to figure out how I can go from here to here by picking some intermediate states, if you will. And so we've got some data here. And um, it's kind of hard to read if you're looking close. I'll try to read the numbers here. But on the left here is the distance to the goal. So this is if you're just going to say, I'm only going to take a move that gets me closer to my goal. Then you would follow this six, you have six steps from the distance, and you just want this to go down in number. This is the distance to the sub-goal. And we'd like to reduce that too. So let's just take a look. We start at our initial position, which is uh, zero here. Distance to goal is six. Distance to first sub-goal is four. We move forward one step. We're, we're now three steps to our sub-goal. We move once more. We're now one step to our sub-goal. We're three steps. This is line two, uh, our, the third line down. It's labeled line two. Uh, we're three steps from our goal, but we're one step from our sub-goal. And then on the fourth line down, we're at our first sub-goal. So we're zero from the sub-goal, but the distance to the goal, the final, is four. And what's interesting here is if you look back at the third line, the distance to the goal was three. And then we moved to our sub-goal, and now we're at four. So we're moving away from our goal. And this is the reason why we do a fractional method is oftentimes we always are trying to progress closer and closer to our goal, and we don't realize that we need to step back in order to get away uh, from a barrier that's there. And so if we continue from this fourth line down to the fifth, we move uh, the big ring from the leftmost to the rightmost. Now we're two steps from our end goal. We're four steps, though, now from our sub-goal. And so the next line, we move backwards. So we go from two steps to the final goal, back to three steps from the final goal. But we move from four to three for our sub-goal. And as you walk it down, we eventually work it down to the bottom line. And you can look through this if you just go through line by line. The basic idea is if you're trying to get just to your final goal, you can't get there. The sub-goals make us go back. And if you look on the right, you can see what we're doing is we're starting up here and we're going to sub-goal one, which gets us around a barrier. And then we get to sub-goal two, which gets us around the next barrier. And we get around. And if you're a little confused about what are the barriers, the barrier is this constraint that we can't put the big ring on the smaller ring. So this is just an example about how a means end would always try to get us closer and closer to our goal. But if there's a barrier, we've got to find a way around. And so a fractional method of setting a sub-goal is a way to do this. All right. Now I want to talk about uh, strong methods. The weak methods we kind of use intuitively. They're not real robust, so they're not something we focus a lot on. Uh, but the strong methods are ones I think we're more accustomed to. So I want to talk a little bit now about those. They utilize some knowledge about the problem or problem type and they can go from general guidance to an exact solution. Okay. The first one is what's called auxiliary problems. And this is using information from a simpler, smaller problem to solve a more advanced problem. And an example I use here is I need to move 100 boxes from here to the next building every hour. So that's my big problem. But I'm not sure how to do that. So I might pick an auxiliary problem and say, how do I move one box? Right? So the idea is you just take the big problem you have, and if you will, you can think about it, oh, you're just breaking it up into pieces. And that's true, but I'm trying to find pieces that represent the bigger problem. It's not that I'm taking the big problem and saying there's five steps. I'll solve step one, two, three, four. I'm actually looking at what are the hard parts of the problem, and is there a simpler problem like that that I could solve? And that can give me some insight into how to solve it. The next one is uh, analogous transfer. And this is using similar problems and their solutions to solve a current problem. All right, I want you to take a second to read this. And uh, you can pause it if you're, um, if you're watching this virtually. All right, um, let's go ahead and take a look. Does anybody know how you can solve this? OK, maybe a few people. Let me ask you a question. Does this remind you of anything that's happened to you today from the time you got up and came into school? 
Does this remind you of anything that's happened in this class? Does it seem familiar in any way? I know some of you think you've got solutions, but for those who don't have a solution, or let me ask a question, for those who have a solution, is there anything during your day or in this class that helped you get to that solution? And for those of you that don't have a solution, just think about this class. Is there anything that happened in this class that could help you figure out a solution to this problem? For those of you that read the Red Adair problem, if you look at it now and look back at the malignant tumor, uh, tumor it's really to do the same solution. You can't bring all the energy to kill the tumor, so you bring it in from different directions, just as Red Adair had solved the water problem for getting the fire and the fire hoses or the foam. The general and the dictator. Same thing, I can't march my entire army over the one bridge, so I bring them in from different sides. So what I noticed was that every one of you read one or either of these stories at the beginning of class, yet probably three quarters of you didn't have a solution to the malignant tumor, even though this is the exact solution for this. It looked like about half of you that got a solution realized that it did really relate to these. So this was an experiment that was done uh, and published on the ability for people to transfer analogies from one area to another. So it was, what, 50 minutes ago that you read one of these two stories? And I told you we were going to do an exercise later on that related to these. But yet, most of you couldn't put the connection in your mind together. And by the way, I, I couldn't either. It wasn't, uh, it's something that most people cannot do. Let's see if I can get this to move forward. Um, let's see. There we go. So these are the results of the uh, paper up here on the top. And what they did is, um, the first line is, somebody read one of the two stories and then went to solve the tumor problem. Um, and they were told that the story had something to do with solving the tumor problem. And so what they found is 92% of the people could complete it if they were given a story with a solution in it and told that that story was or related to the solution of this. The second line is, same thing, just exactly what you did here. You read the one story, and then sometime later, you saw the malignant tumor, but you weren't told explicitly that there was a connection. Only 20% of the people completed the solution. So then they did another one where they had people review, read both stories, and they actually did a discussion about the two stories, the solution, how it worked, the similarities. And then at a later time gave them the tumor problem. So they even talked about it and had them synthesize. So you might have thought, well, I wasn't paying attention to the story. Here they explicitly got them to pay attention to the story. Only 40%, 39% were able to solve it. So 60% of the people, after going through an entire synthesis of the two problems that are exactly the same solution, didn't get it. And the last one was they gave you one of those two stories and then another story that had no relevance. And they found you back to the 21%. So basically back to the one story, no hint. So even though you're given a story, you're told, now I told you it had something to do with something later, I didn't tell you what. So unless somebody makes an explicit connection, most people don't make those connections on their own. And this is two things. One, this is what analogous transfer is. You have a one situation, you see an analogy with what you're trying to solve now, and you connect the two. But the problem is, is that most of us don't make those connections. So let's see if this will work for us. Yay! I don't know what I did before, but it works now. Um, so the shortcomings is, one, it requires you to have solved a related problem. You can't make an analogy to something you've never seen before. It requires you to remember the related problem, and it requires you to transfer knowledge to the new problem. Okay? The two things that make analogous transfer difficult is uh, remembering and transferring. And so we're going to do a little bit of an exercise here uh, to show this explicitly to you um, now that you've seen this. The next one makes it a little bit more concrete, I think. So here is problem one, and we'll stop here for a second. You can pause the video if you'd like, and just read this problem. 
Okay, if you look down at the bottom, what you'll notice is it actually gives you the mathematical solution to solve this. Okay, so we've got knights, a jousting tournament, uh, the eight knights uh, had to choose a horse, and then we went through some random stuff. This is once again a, a bad memory from a, uh, a random problems class. Okay, let's go look at problem two. All right, so take a few minutes to read this. You can pause the video if you like. All right, so in this problem, we've got 29 horses of the princes, and they could talk. That's kind of cool. And they got to choose their knights, and they go through some more probability things. Is this similar to the problem you had before, or is it different? Think for a second. All right, let's go to a third problem. All right, once again, take a chance to read the third problem. You can pause the video, take a read. All right, so in this, we have a puppy palace trying to find new homes for 29 puppies. There's 24 children who are very excited about getting friendly puppies. Uh, they have to fight over the puppies, and they need to figure out how to make the choice. How does this relate to the first two problems? For those of you that sort of have picked up that there's probably a catch to all this, you may have thought, hmm, maybe they're the same. All three problems are identical in structure. Sorry. They all use the formula on the bottom in exactly the same way. It's exactly the same statistics. The difference is here, the knights choose the horses. Here, the horses choose the knights, and the numbers are different. And here we've got puppies and kids, and the numbers are different. Most people don't see a connection between the three problems. Even engineers and scientists, college students, don't see the connection. And the reason is, is that our ability to transfer is based upon primarily our ability to remember details rather than concepts. So the problem is you probably can remember the first two had to do with horses and knights, and the third one had to do with puppy dogs, but horse stories remind you of other horse stories. They don't remind you of, puppies don't remind you of a horse story. There's also a relationship parity problem, and that's because initially the knights were choosing horses. In the second problem, the horses were choosing knights. Now while you probably can think to yourself, oh, I see that there really is no difference, it's really hard to connect the two problems you're more likely to connect the first problem with another problem where somebody's choosing a horse than you are a problem that has exactly the same mathematical foundation. Most people cannot transfer the problem if it isn't similar both in the details and in the construction. That means we have horses and knights, and the knights are choosing the horses. If you give me another problem with, with knights and horses, and knights are choosing something, or another story where people are choosing horses, I'll make the connections. But if you swap who's choosing who, or you change the identity to puppies and kids, I can almost never recall and connect that. Or at least it's difficult for me to. Uh, so here's a point I'll make a little bit later. We can identify incline problems in physics if they look like incline problems. If you're not familiar with incline problems, it's basically any problem in math or physics you've seen at one point. If it looks exactly like the same as a problem you solved before, you make the connection. If it's changed a little bit, it gets really hard to make that connection. So now I want to talk about something called uh, isomorphs. And this is a big word, but all it means is it's things that are the same, but are changed in some way. And so um, here's a carnival game. Uh, and the carnival game goes as following. We have numbers one through nine. And uh, you put down nickels, I put down gold dollars. I'm the carnival master. And whoever is the first to cover three different numbers that add to 15 gets all the money on the table. Okay? So why don't we try to play a game? Okay, here we go. All right? Sorry, I had to go out of uh, presentation mode. So you guys decided you want to go first, and you're going to put one on an eight. Okay, I'm going to come through, and I'm going to put my gold dollar on three. You are then going to say, you know what? What would you guys say? 
you want to put it on, um, so you've already got eight, so what are you thinking? You're going to put it down on, oops, I got the wrong one there. You guys are going to put it down on five. There we go. Boom. All right, so you've got one on five and eight. I've got one on three, but five and eight make 13, so I need to block you on two. Okay, so there we are. And now you're thinking you've got eight, you've got five. What are you going to do next? One? Okay. Okay. Now you've noticed you just have to have three that add up to 15. You've got, sorry, you've got one, five, and eight. So one and five is six, one and eight is nine. So you've got to figure out a third one that's going to get there. And one and eight is nine. And, ah, if you, um, if you pick six, I think I would lose. So I'm going to go here, and I'm going to choose six. And now I've got two, three, and six. That's five, 11. All right. And so um, is there anything you guys can do next? You've got eight. You've got one. I blocked you on six, five, can't do three. And you guys choose nine. And so you've got nine, 10, 16. None of these three add up to 15. And I'm going to choose four. And we don't have to go through this. You can choose seven. And what you'll see is nobody wins. All right? OK? So that was a quick little game to play. And you might be thinking, OK, so why is it so important? Does this game remind you of anything? Anything you've played before? I've never played this carnival game. But this is an isomorph of a very popular game that I'm sure everybody here has seen, or most of you have seen here. So let's go look at what are all the options for putting these together, or what are the possible solutions? Oops, wrong button. Here are all the solutions that add to 15. OK? Now, I didn't initially see much of a pattern in this, but you can actually arrange these numbers in an easy to remember way so you can sort of play the game. And this is how the carnival guy plays the game. And by the way, I didn't mention it before, but the carnival guy will always win or tie. You will never win the game. OK? Never. And I'll explain why in just a second. Have you already seen the title? If you arrange the numbers this way, you can see this is just tic-tac-toe. So you already know how to play tic-tac-toe. And if I played you in a game of tic-tac-toe, I'm sure you would never lose. But the way that the carnival guy morphed the problem into what looked like a totally different problem. They changed how it was played, but the whole structure and all the rules and everything for the solution was identical. And this is what an isomorph is. And the reason why isomorphs are so important is you go back to problem representation. Oftentimes, we just need to change. If I took the carnival game and said, let's play for tic-tac-toe, none of you would put your money down. But initially, when I gave you the game, it would seem like I'm putting down dollars, you're putting down nickels. It seems like I could lose big time. But in reality, I can't. And so isomorphs are a very cool way uh, to think about a different way of viewing problems in a different representation. So I think this is a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool example of that. All right, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about pattern matching. You can find a solution path based on past experience and knowledge of patterns. So this is a solution method where basically I've seen something like this. There was a pattern before. I'm going to apply that pattern again. So for instance, in a maze, if you've been through it several times, you've figured out how to get around, right? Like in a building, you know how to get from one office to the next because you've gone through it a few times, you've figured that out. You can just match the pattern that you've done. Um, so let's look at it as an example of chess. So De Groot did a, um, a famous paper in 1965, and he asked the important question, why are masters better chess players than weaker players? And I've got to say, I've always wondered. I just I don't know. I just figured they were smarter. I've seen the movie Bobby, uh, Bobby Fischer. I always thought there was something they possessed that, that maybe I didn't. And so what DeGroote did is he went and he looked and said, do masters examine more alternatives than novices? Okay, maybe they can see more things than we can. Do they examine deeper, meaning are they thinking 10, 20, 30 moves ahead and I can only think two moves ahead? Or I added this one, are they just smarter? They're just smarter than you and I are and that's why they're able to be masters and we're not. The other thing is, do they have better memories? 
they always talk about I can see the board. And I always thought that was because they just had better memories than I. They were able to envision the board. They had this visual memory that the rest of us don't. And so the group went and did a very interesting experiment. What he noticed in his experiment was that masters and novices searched about 30 to 50 moves before making a decision. Masters and novices both uh, searched two to three moves deep, meaning only a couple moves ahead. But masters always made much better moves than novices. Why? They're not searching broader, they're not searching deeper. What is the difference? And so here's his experiment. On the left is a board that's in the middle of a chess game that was actually played. On the right is a board, but the chess pieces aren't in legal places, meaning you couldn't have gotten to this point by taking legal chess points. And what he did is he had a uh, novice, an, a class A player, which is a very good player, and a master player look at the board on the left, walk away, come back and try to reconstruct it. Also look on the board on the right, go away and come back and reconstruct it. And here's the data. If you look closely, you can sort of see on the left is um, the top is the middle games, meaning we're in the middle of a game. That was the picture on the left. That's a real game. And what you notice is that the masters, the M here, they have a much higher number of correct pieces. And the trials is they get to go back many times and see it. So they go back, they come back, try to reconstruct it. They see it again, they come back. And you can see that the masters get better and better. But they're clearly better than the class A and the class B. So maybe they really can just see it better. The memory is better. But what's interesting is when you look at when the board is random, it's not a valid play. The masters have fewer correct pieces than both the class A and the class B players. The reason the masters were able to reconstruct the board was because it was a pattern that they recognized. If it's not a pattern that they recognize, they actually were hindered because it didn't match something. They were trying to match it. They couldn't handle something that was random because they were trying to fit it into a box. And what this showed very clearly is it's not that chess masters have a better or photographic memory. It's not that they're able to see something, they've got it, they've memorized it. No, it's that they've learned in their mind all of the different chess moves. And it's, if they see a chess move or a chess uh, situation, they just recognize it. On the right is the same kind of data for uh, end game. So this is basically where you have a checkmate. And once again, um, if it's a correct end game, the masters are better able to reconstruct. And if it is random, uh, no one is able to be, do any better. The masters aren't any better at reconstructing uh, the problem. So this was really, uh, I, think, I think, for me, quite interesting. So here's an analogy I'll draw for you. I don't speak Chinese, uh, but if you do, this may make perfect sense to you, right? I just Googled innovation. This is the Chinese characters that came up. So roughly 3,500 Chinese characters cover 99.5% of the Chinese language in common use. But there's over 80,000 characters. Chess masters are, are, are um, uh, they expect they know roughly 50,000 boards. So the analogy here is when a chess master looks at a board, it's just like somebody who can speak and write Chinese can look at a Chinese character and immediately see it for what it is. Chess masters just simply have a larger vocabulary. It's not that they're able to do some superhuman uh, photographic memory. It's just that they have learned 50,000 board characters, if you will, and they've learned also a strategy to work with this. And that's why they say it takes at least 10 years to become a chess master, because it takes that long to learn 50,000 pieces. And 50,000 is not that much. Uh, we here probably know 20,000 words. Some of you maybe know 50,000 words. It's not too tough over your lifespan to learn 50, 60,000 of uh, a certain set. Um, this was an interesting, I'll go back, sorry about that. This was an interesting result. Uh, they went and asked, they want to know what the difference between experts and novices were. This is sort of like the chess master. So we showed that the difference between a chess master and a novice was really this encyclopedia of moves that they've memorized over 10 years. But if you go to a freshman physics student, you go to a physics professor and ask them to classify different problems, the results are kind of interesting. It kind of goes back to this problem of the horses and the knights and the puppy dogs and the children. If you look at all the problems on the left, 
Uh, it's kind of a little bit hard to read in here, but the, the novices cataloged all of these as things that deal with blocks on an inclined plane. To them, these were all inclined plane and block problems. All of the experts, all the professors, looked at conservation of energy, work energy theorem. What they noticed was it wasn't that the problem solving methods of the experts and the novices were really different. It was that the experts had built a larger, more encompassing view in classification. So they didn't look at the details, they could actually see the underlying pattern and that's how they classified them. And so that's really when you get somebody who's an expert. An expert is really somebody who's gone out and learned enough of the patterns where they're able to classify them at higher levels and that allows them to make those uh, analogies that we weren't. A mathematics professor would immediately see those three problems about horses, knights, knights, horses, children, puppies, immediately see them as the same problem. Somebody who's never studied probability we look at them as totally different problems. So that was a very interesting result of what separates them is that experts are just better able to make this uh, anal uh, analogous transfer uh, than novices are in their field because of experience. And then finally, uh, this is something I've saved towards the end. There's algorithms for how to solve problems. Uh, for those that are mathematics, uh, if we're given this problem here, ax squared plus bx plus c, We've learned in school, if you haven't learned in school, there's a solution, you just plug and chug and you get your answer. So this is what school teaches us. School teaches us an algorithm to solve a specific problem. And I want to share with you one of my favorite algorithms that I didn't know until I did some reading recently. So here's a maze. Now we said earlier, if you go through a maze a dozen times, you'll eventually figure out the pattern to get through. But is there an algorithm to get through a maze that's 100% successful? Turns out there is. If you put either your right or left hand on the wall and never take it off, you'll get through the maze. Just start here on the left and envision yourself with one hand on the wall. And what you notice is that if you keep one hand on the wall, you basically go into a dead end and you walk right out. And you'll never return to the same spot again. So it's really cool. It is really an algorithm that gets you to solve mazes 100% of the time. Even though I got to tell you, I've played mazes, you know, in the crossword puzzles many times uh, in the papers, and um, I never figured out. That is an algorithm for that. All right, so this is to summarize today. Problem search and representation are key parts of problem solving. Problem search leads to the type of problem you're going to solve and what the solution looks like. So it's the, it's the biggest impact, if you will. Problem representation Two things. One is, some representations are easier to solve than others. So you want to find the easy one. And two, we form representations without even knowing it. And that's what we have to watch out for. We have to figure out how we're representing the problem. And what I do often is I actually stop and come back and try to describe it in a different way. And see if I can find a different way to represent the problem that's maybe easier. We talked about weak and strong information. Information helps in the solution most of the time. Sometime we talked in some of the early classes about creativity, information can be a blocker, but here we talked about it does, in general, help you solve problems. And the two biggest human advantages and disadvantages are that one, we're pattern matchers, we're able to solve problems, it's what leads to creativity, in my opinion. But the downside of our mind is that our memory is very limited, unless we package it together in a hierarchical form, in a pattern, if you will. So basically leveraging how our mind works. All right, that's it for today on complex problem solving. Feel free to email me if you have any questions, um, and we'll see you next time.